What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about hemoptysis. This is a part of our clinical medicine section. If you guys like this video, it helps you, it makes sense, please support us, and you can do that by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, really urge you guys, please, if you guys get an opportunity, go down in the description box below. There's a link to our website. Really urge you guys to become members. We have a lot of cool things there. We got notes, we get illustrations, we're developing question banks, we're developing exam prep courses, and if you guys want to, we even have some merchandise that you guys can take a look at. All right, let's start talking about hemoptysis. This is a super quick lecture. It's designed to help you guys understand how to work it up, really. So when a patient develops hemoptysis, how would we define that? That's when they're coughing up blood. Really, that's the primary feature that you want to look for. When a patient is coughing up blood, you definitely want to be thinking about hemoptysis. Now, whenever a patient starts coughing up blood, you know, the thing that you should start running through your mind is what's the reason for this? And the pathophysiological process comes down to three particular things. One is there's bronchoalveolar inflammation. Something is inflaming or infecting the airways, and that's causing a potential erosion through the bronchial wall, and then eventually some bronchial arteries to be ulcerated and blood to leak in. That's the primary pathophysiology. So what are some a couple things to think about? Well, one of these things that can cause bronchoalveolar inflammation would be potentially pneumonia. So sometimes necrotizing pneumonia can definitely do this. I would think that about this more particularly um, as a particular pathogen such as tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a relatively common cause of patients developing pretty significant hemoptysis. So that's one. So if a patient has an infection here, let's say, of their bronchoalveolar area, and it just kind of erodes into the smaller bronchial artery area, they can start developing blood that kind of starts leaking in to the bronchial airways. And then eventually, it'll trigger the irritation of the airways and cause them to cough that up. Another scenario could be potentially just bronchitis. You know patients who develop bronchitis, like acute bronchitis? This is another really common etiology as well. So bronchitis is a really particular big one. Another one would be whenever they have dilation of the airways and lots of inflammation that it begins to cause erosion. That would be a big one with what's called bronchiectasis. This is a very common cause of massive hemoptysis, which sometimes people like to define by volumes or rate at which we produce the amount of blood from the cough, but I would think it's more determined based upon the degree of hemodynamic instability or respiratory failure that you should base massive hemoptysis. But we'll talk about that in the complications. Either way, these are the big things that are going to be precipitating this particular process here where blood will be leaking into the airway via the bronchial arteries being eroded. Now, that is, again, a big point here. When we talk about hemoptysis, there is bronchial arteries that are the primary artery that are getting eroded into or ulcerated into that are causing hemoptysis. 90, 95% of the time, it's those. Rare scenarios, and I mean rare, like 5% of cases, it could be pulmonary vascular diseases. And these pulmonary vascular diseases, I think the two big ones that I want you guys to think about here is, one is you have a clot. You know patients who develop particular clots such as a pulmonary embolism? So I want you to think about maybe a pulmonary embolism, this can cause hemoptysis. I'd say it's relatively rare. Um, this could be from an infarction of the lung tissue, this could be because of elevated pressures proximal to the actual embolus, but either way, this can definitely cause bleeding to occur. All right? Now, another one that I would say is definitely something to consider would be something called vasculitis. This is actually a high yield one to remember. So there is many different types of vasculitides, but I think the two big ones that I want you guys to remember here are called anca vasculitis, which you see with what's called granulomatosis polyangiitis, also known as Wegner's. And another one is called um, anti-GBM uh, antibodies, which is related to a, a disease called good pastures disease. Usually this causes blood in the kidneys and blood in the lungs. That's one way that you can think about it. But again, anti GBM antibodies cause attack of the actual lung tissue and particularly the small pulmonary vessels. And so if you cause destruction of these, you can cause blood to leak out into the actual airways and then again cause hemoptysis. These are two really big ones, but I'd focus on vasculitis and I would also think about, again, bronchoalveolar inflammation. The last one here I would say is a really, really common cause and it's pretty obvious, I think, based upon the name here is bronchoalveolar neoplasia. And this is usually due to lung cancer. So when patients have lung cancer, this is a really big one because they get lots of blood supply to the lung cancer. 
And whenever you get lots of blood supply to the lung cancer, there is no doubt about it that that can actually lead to bleeding. And so patients who develop hemoptysis, I want you to think three pathophysiological processes. One, inflammation or infection. Bronchiectasis, necrotizing pneumonia, with the big one being tuberculosis, as well as acute bronchitis. Bronchoalveolar neoplasia, such as lung cancer, and then lastly, pulmonary vascular disease with an emphasis more on vasculitis. Now that we've talked about hemoptysis and what that actually is and the causes of pathophys, let's talk about the complications that can arise. All right, my friends, now we're gonna talk about the complications associated with massive hemoptysis. So if a patient's really coughing up massive amounts of blood and they're really having a really, really terrible one, usually this could be things like vasculitides or this could be bronchiectasis, when there's large amounts of volumes of blood that are being kind of coughed out of the airways or not effectively coughed out of the airways, that can definitely become a problem. So imagine there's just massive volumes that are coming from your bronchioles. Not all of it's going to be effectively coughed up. And so because of that, one of the problems here is you can definitely start filling up some of these alveoli. And if you start filling up a lot of these alveoli with blood, what's the potential complication that's going to arise here? Are you going to get any good ventilation to these alveoli? No. And so the downstream effect of having massive hemoptysis is it's going to be literally impossible to clear all of it. And so what will happen is, is you're going to lead to alveolar filling. And this is going to be filled with blood. And if there's alveolar filling, that's going to lead to massive VQ mismatch, potentially even a shunt process. And we know that VQ mismatching or shunt processes make it very, very difficult for gas exchange to occur here. And this will be significantly impaired. So as perfusion may remain normal through these, whenever the blood leaves this particular area where the alveolar hemorrhage is, this is definitely going to lead to a reduction in oxygen. And this is referred to as hypoxemia. And that could be a potential scary thing that you can have here is massive hemoptysis leading to alveolar filling, leading to VQ mismatch, leading to hypoxemia. Now, when these patients become hypoxemic, they may look pretty terrible. There is no doubt about it that they could potentially have an increased respiratory rate, an increased work of breathing as a result of this. So watch out for that. But again, I think that this is really one of the big things to take away here is that respiratory failure is a potential sign of massive hemoptysis due to alveolar filling, VQ mismatch, and then as an effect, hypoxemia. All right, my friends, now that we've covered hemoptysis causes, pathophys, and complications, let's now talk about how to diagnose it. How do we approach hemoptysis? Well, if a patient's coughing up blood, first thing that I would do is I would make sure that you just rule out a simple coagulopathy. Do they have, are they on anticoagulants or anything like that that could be causing this? If it's abnormal, it could be a coagulopathy. The next thing is obtain acid fast bacillus for what? This would be particularly for tuberculosis and sputum cultures for necrotizing infections. And then the next thing I would do is I obtain an ANCA and an anti-GBM antibody because this will tell me if this is going to be GPA, right? Especially if it's the C ANCA or if it's EPA and MPA, if it's the P ANCAs, an anti-GBM for good pasture syndrome, okay? And lastly, I would also consider obtaining a CT pulmonary angiogram. This is going to give me a look at the CT of the chest, so it'll give me a look at the bronchial tree, but it'll also give me a look at the pulmonary vessels, and I'll help to be able to see if there's a pulmonary embolism, bronchiectasis, or a lung mass, like a lung neoplasia. And that's how we can work up the causes. But whenever we're talking about treating hemoptysis and diagnosing at the same time, it's really important to have this approach in your brain. So if a patient has hemoptysis, you need to ask yourself the question, is it massive enough that it's causing respiratory failure? Don't base it on the volume, base it upon the risk of respiratory failure. Do they need to be intubated? In other words, is there so much sheer volume of blood in the airway that they can't cough and clear the blood from their airway? That's going to cause respiratory failure. Or are they already experiencing hypoxemic respiratory failure? If the answer is no, then you can hold off on intubation and the patient is stable enough that if you lay them flat in a CT scanner, they're not going to aspirate blood or end up going into respiratory failure. So get a chest CT. Look to see if you can find the focal source of bleeding and where it is. If you find that source of bleeding, oh, it's in one of these bronchial arteries that I located, okay, I'm going to send them to IR, interventional radiology. They'll sneak a catheter into the area and embolize that bronchial vessel and stop the bleeding. 
If the patient does require intubation because they can't clear the blood, they can't cough it, they're ex experiencing hypoxemia, there's no way in heck I'm going to send this patient to the CT scanner to lay flat without intubating them. They'll aspirate, they'll exp experience a lot of VQ mismatch, they'll end up coding over there in the CT scan. So I'm going to intubate these patients and then what I'll do is I'll use a bronchoscope to see if I can find where the bleeding is. If I can find where the bleeding is in one of those actual bronchi, then what I'm going to do is I'll say, okay, I got an idea of where this is. I can then tell IR. For right now, I'm going to put an endobronchial blocker in, which is going to be from the endotracheal tube, and that's going to block that off, and then I can go in and embolize that via IR. If the patient goes to IR and embolization fails, they can't embolize the artery. Let's say here they go in, oh, there it is. I found the actual vessel, embolized it. Good, we're done. But if the embolization failed, then you have to say, is this more of like a central bronchial lesion or a proximal bronchial lesion? I might be better to do a rigid bronchoscopy and just go in there and cauterize it or laser that bleed. If they fail and they have refractory hemoptysis, in other words, you've tried everything to stop this dang bleeding and it won't stop, then you go to a surgery like a pneumonectomy or a lobectomy. All right, so that's how we would diagnostically and treatment-wise approach hemoptysis. I hope this made sense, guys. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.